Thank you, Xavier, for the presentation and uh, your kind invitation. Thank you all for being here to the closing presentation. So, last but not least, Dulcis in Fundo, we have uh, a presentation on the UTS and its followers connecting the dots. So that's the title that I, I chose, um, where the term connecting the dots can be interpreted in two ways, in a metaphorical way, meaning finding the big picture behind the data, but also in literally terms, because in a while you'll see me connecting dots. So, a brief overview. I will first briefly describe the features, problems, and related literature of the EU ETS. And then we'll try to provide a new perspective um, describing the evolution of the EUTS using network theory uh, analysis. Finally, I will uh, briefly look at the others, what I call the followers, and at the possible linking between Europe and the others. So, as to the first point, as you know, the e European ETS is widely recognized as a leader among uh, emission trading systems. The ETS in Europe has set several records over time. It's the world's largest carbon market, the first transboundary cap and trade system. It covers over 11,000 installations, 31 countries accounting for 45% or so of GHG emissions, and it has progressively extended over time, including additional sectors beyond the initial ones, additional gases beyond CO2, and longer compliance periods. Uh, from the uh, first two years of the learning phase, we are now in a much longer period, uh, uh, right now in the third phase. For this reason, uh, I would say that the ETS, the European ETS, inspired the others, and so I agree with Ellerman, who said that the UTS can be considered as a prototype for the others. However, we have run through several problems, uh, as any prototype does. Uh, we experience over-allocation, especially at the beginning, uh, some difficulties in shifting from grandfathering to auctioning, some monitoring problems like the well-known frauds in the Blue Next uh, uh, French exchange system, and price volatility, or better, price fall during the last years. These problems have attracted the attention of a large and ever-growing literature on the EUTS that examines several aspects, from over-allocation of allowances in the initial phase, to the drivers of price volatility. From the fraud and monitoring problems I was referring to before, to the reform proposal that has been set forth to improve the system. From the role of banking and borrowing, to the effects that the UATS has had on several aspects. First of all, eco-innovation, so environmental friendly innovation, technological progress. Secondly, the competitiveness of, of the firms, and the carbon leakage effects, the, the risk of delocalization, and so the carbon leakage exemptions that come together with it. And finally, there is a large literature that looks at the linking scenarios that I will refer to at the end of my presentation. But despite this large literature, what is missing, in my view, is an attention on market structure and a detailed description of the market structure. Uh, one exception is represented by a project that was uh, uh, conducted here at the EUI and led to a European uh, UI working paper in 2013 by Gerard and others, who look at the ownership situation in phase one, basically mapping each installation to the global ultimate owner. Another paper on market structure is the, and market participation is the one by uh, Betts and Schmidt, who look at the role of the different account types in phase one and find that most account types were not participating and only very few ones, non-regulated companies, were very active on the market. So building on a recent work with my colleague Andrea Flori, um, what I want to do here is to provide a network analysis, and uh, to the best of our knowledge is the first one in this sense, to extend this analysis, the previous literature, in several directions. In intertemporal terms, so including phase two, 
to additional account types beyond those that were already considered, and to the role of the states. To do that, I will then describe the system as a graph with vertices V and uh, represented by the set of registries and edges E that stands for the number of traded permits. So these links, these edges, are oriented from transferring to acquiring registry and are weighted according to the number of permits being transferred. So what we have is the so-called adjacency matrix whose entries are either zero or one. Zero if two nodes are not connected and one if they are. And when they are, the node, the connection, the link is weighted according to the number of uh, permits being exchanged between the two nodes. As I said, we look at the first two phases. So our data come from the European transaction log and cover the period 2005-2012. Each node is the aggregate of accounts registered in one country. And we aggregate the data on a monthly basis because this ensures a good data coverage while allowing to describe the evolution of the system over time. We could have gone for a more granular uh, description with uh, data on a weekly or a daily basis, but we would have probably lost the capacity to detect any trend. We perform two kinds of partitions. We distinguish um, transactions uh, between internal and external, so within countries and across countries. And then we distinguish them according to the different kind of account types being involved. In particular, we look at operator holding account and person holding account. The operator holding account are uh, mandatory accounts, one for each regulated installation. Person holding account are instead voluntary accounts opened by unregulated firms, mainly financial intermediaries like banks, brokers, uh, funds, and so on. We use three measures of network uh, analysis, in-out strength, assortativity, and page rank. The in-out strength measures the number of incoming links and departing links. The assertivity is a person correlation between the strength of two connected nodes, whereas the page rank, as the name says, ranks the nodes according to their centrality in the system. It accounts for the in-house trend, so it accounts for the number of links, but also for the centrality of my partners. So, a node can be very central, not only if it has many links, but also if it has a few links with some very connected partners. So let me give you a visual representation first of the network. Um, as you see in the diagram, the size of the nodes is proportional to the int strength, the color to the page rank, that ranges from blue for low values to red to high values. And the white of the link is proportional to the number of traded amounts. If you look at the picture, you see that there are five big nodes, five uh, countries that emerge in the system, France, Great Britain, Germany, Denmark, and the Netherlands. As you would expect, the bigger nodes are also more reddish. Namely, if you have higher number of links, you are also more central. But this is not always the case. Consider, for instance, Netherlands and Spain. They have almost the same size, same number of links, but the Netherlands is much more central than Spain. So depending on the kind of partners you are exchanging with. And actually, Spain is even less central than Italy and Portugal that are uh, smaller nodes. We then look at uh, the contribution of the different accounts. So the table here reports on the rows the number of transfer accounts, so the supply side, and on the columns, the number of purchasing accounts, the demand side. Distinguish five kinds of uh, operators. Holding accounts are basically government accounts that use this for issuance or surrender purposes. 
pending account are accounts where international credits coming from outside Europe are temporarily set, waiting for them to, be, to become eligible for the European market. Operator holding account are what I said before, mandatory account, one for each regulated installation, and so they're mainly for compliance purposes. Person holding account are those mainly for trading purposes used by financial intermediaries, so voluntary accounts. Voluntary cancellation accounts are those for firms closing up. And finally, NA stands for not available, so missing information. Two things emerge from the table. The first one is that person holding account largely dominated the market in the first two phases, accounting for 53% of total demand and 55% of total supply. And so they largely outweighed the operator holding account, 14 and 24, and the uh, uh, governance accounts, 16 and 19 percent of demand and supply. The second uh, remarkable aspect is that we have uh, many misinformation at the moment, or better, on the first two phases, especially as far as the demand side is concerned. You see, we have more than uh, 100,000 missing information, so for which we don't know the uh, purchasing counterpart, out of 653,000. We then look at the contribution of the different types of transactions. And here, as I said, we distinguish between internal and external transactions. Uh, internal transactions are uh, reported with code 10 uh, in the UTL, external ones with code 3, and then within the external ones we have a subdivision with, according to the period, so code 321 refers to phase 1, code 3.0 to phase 2. And as you can see from the table, internal transactions were much more frequent in the first two phases, but external ones are growing quite fast, both in terms of number of transactions from 15,000 to 127,000, and in terms of the volume being exchanged from one to a magnitude of 11. So denoting a market that is uh, somehow expanding across countries. We then computed the page ranks, so the centrality of the countries, distinguishing by different account types and different periods, phase one and phase two. Too many numbers, too small, but don't panic, let me drive you through the numbers. What we find is that Germany, within the OHA context, played a central role, by, was by far the most central country. And it was more central for OHA than PHA. You see, 0.14 versus 0.10. Uh, if you look at the other four remaining big nodes, France, uh, Denmark, uh, Great Britain, and the Netherlands, the opposite applies. They were more central among financial intermediaries than among uh, mandatory um, compliant uh, um, firms. The registries that were less central in phase one remain out of the network, far from the core of the network, also in, in phase two. We indicated with the green arrows the cases in which the page rank increased in a country, and the red arrows those in which they decreased. So as you see, different countries have different behaviors. Some countries, like Poland or Portugal, saw an increase in their page rank for both OHA and PHA. In Italy, we had a decrease of the centrality of Italy among OHA, but an increase among financial intermediaries. And the opposite applies to France, uh, uh, Austria, Czech Republic, and so on. But what emerged uh, in general is that the page rank decreased from phase one to phase two. So less central nodes. This seems to suggest that the system became more homogeneous over time, with less very few central nodes as uh, we used to have at the beginning, which might reflect the simple extension of the EUTS to additional countries, but also the fact that we don't rely any longer to a few hubs that played a dominant role at the beginning. In terms of account types, what we find is that the PHA had a dominant role. 
And you can see that by comparing the column PHA with the following ones that were obtained by including additional accounts. So OHA and then government accounts and all, all kinds of accounts. If you compare the results, you will see that the numbers are basically unchanged with respect to the PHA. So the results basically depend on the centrality of a country within the financial intermediary context. I then provide, uh, uh, again, a representation of the intertemporal evolution of the uh, page rank over time, distinguished by account types. So if we focus on operator holding account, we find a decreasing pattern for all countries in phase one, and then different patterns in phase two, but within a stricter range of values, so with more similar values. If you look at the PHA, then you can distinguish two sets of countries. Above the dotted line, you have UK, France, and Germany. So the countries where investors are more prone to go, generally. And below the curve, you have the so-called peaks, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. Again, different countries have different trends, but we observe a sort of convergence between France and Italy and Spain that actually, I can tell you, looking at the data, it seems to continue over time so that this distinction that we used to have at the beginning tends to vanish. And interesting aspect is also that when France starts decreasing, uh, Great Britain and Germany start increasing. And since the declining part of France coincides more or less with the blue next problems, uh, the VAT fraud, I tend to believe that financial intermediaries shifted from Paris to London and Frankfurt as a consequence of that. But this is purely speculation, obviously, it's just an idea. The final network measures I want to show is the assortativity. If you look, again, I divided by different account types. The top diagram is the one for OHA. And what you see is a very volatile trend with values that stay always positive, always above zero. If you depict the same for the financial intermediaries, you will find a slightly declining trend with values that move from positive in the first phase to negative in the second phase. This switch to disassortativity suggests that financial intermediaries start exchanging permits in a more diversified way. Basically, they start to uh, change their partners, uh, to have a wider set of partners with respect to before. Not only with their similar partners, but with more counter-similar agents. This again might reflect the fact that the European Union system at large but also it might also reflect a risk diversification, a portfolio diversification in a way, also because the second phase, as we know, coincides with the financial crisis. So at the time of a more risky time, uh, require a more precautionary approach. Whatever the reason for that, we can say that, again, the PHA dominate in a, in a wider set, even for assortativity, because if you enlarge the set and include OHA or all kinds of accounts, you find the similar trend with a switch into disassociativity for the second phase. So summing up what we have learned so far is that describing the EUETS as a network, uh, we try to reply three questions. Which countries are more central? Which account types are dominant? And what has been the evolution of the market structure? As to the first question, we find that uh, a core, there is a core of central nodes represented by France, Germany, UK, Denmark, and the Netherlands, surrounded by a periphery of marginal registries that tends to remain marginal. Although some of them, as we saw, are reducing the gap. As to the second question, which account types are dominant, we find that the, uh, the financial intermediaries had a dominant impact in the first two phases, which confirms uh, what Betz and Schmidt has found for the first phase, but extending over time and with different, taking into account different account types, so in a more richer, let's say, dimension. 
As to the evolution of the market, we find that the system has become more homogeneous with less central nodes and tended to diversify the trading partners as uh, uh, suggested by the declining associativity I was showing before as we move from phase one to phase two. So far, I try to connect the nodes in literal terms within Europe. What about outside Europe? Can we connect to the others? As I said, Europe is considered the leader, has been considered the leader, has inspired the others. But the others are coming pretty fast. And the chasing group is uh, quite rapid in uh, trying to reach Europe. And also the road is getting steeper as, we, as time goes by. So this is clearly shown by the rapid uh, spread of emission trading over time. This has been shown before during this conference uh, by Thomas, but also other colleagues, because it's a very telling story. And I would define this the sprawl of emission trading, like an urban sprawl, because it's rapidly um, emerging in many different countries. Now, what I try to do in the book that uh, Xavier was mentioning and also in another companion paper, it was to perform a comparative analysis to see what are the main features of the different ETSs. Because I wanted to see whether they are comparable and compatible, so whether they can be linked. And what we find is that the systems are pretty comparable in many respects, in terms of target and compliance periods, although quantitatively numbers different, in terms of scope of application, because most of them go beyond CO2 and include many greenhouse gases, in terms of allocation methods, because they, all of them, if not most of them, are shifting from grandfathering to auctioning, and actually the followers started with auctioning already, so learning from us. In terms of carbon leak and exemptions that are granted in almost every ETS, in terms of use of revenues that are generally tied, so channel towards environmental projects, in terms of banking and borrowing, allowing for banking but not for borrowing. In terms of sanctions and penalties, all systems have their own, although in quantitative terms they differ and this can create some different policy implications. In terms of price floors and price ceilings, at least outside Europe, most of the system introduce uh, explicit floors and ceilings. And I have to say that the price floors turned out to be very useful in some cases. I think of uh, California, Reggi, or the Guangdong region, where the price floor initially hit the floor, uh, avoiding the collapse in, in their learning phase. So all in all, the ETS regime are similar, maybe linked. It will need some effort, obviously, but it's doable. Now, if we look at the linking, however, we have just one linking so far. The mutual recognition, that's what I mean by linking, obviously, mutual recognition of uh, allowances as eligible in both systems, a two-way flows, has occurred only in California and Quebec, uh, with an international agreement reached in 2013. We know that uh, Europe, I did a good job with Australia, but it's not our fault <laughs> because they changed their mind. If we look at the California-Quebec situation, I would say that uh, it's a happy wedding so far. Uh, if we look at the auction revenues in California before and after linking, well, we had a real explosion of the action revenues after the first joint auction that was somehow comparable with the previous ones, then uh, auction revenues more than doubled. So let's say they are in their honeymoon. Um, this seems to suggest that having a good partner is a very good idea, as the guy here on the track seems to think. Or if you want to use the uh, racing, the cyclist uh, uh, metaphor, 
let's say that it would be a good idea for competitors to cooperate on the ETS race as the road gets steeper. But as we all know, any wedding has its pros and cons. The main disadvantage is that you have to give up some freedom. And in this case, you have to give up uh, a partial, partially at least, your sovereignty of the system. This may risk to spread negative effects on prices and behavior from one system to the other if your partner is not reliable. And it may risk you to lose accountability and transparency or better your reputation if the other misbehaves. But linking has also many advantages in terms of, uh, in economic terms, because it allows to have a wider range of compliance opportunities for the agents, increasing returns to scale and more liquidity into the system. In regulatory terms, because it can spread the best practices, I can learn from the others. And most of all, in my view, in political terms, because it can spur international cooperation on climate change. If I link with system B, and with system C, system B and C will be automatically linked among themselves, leading, probably, expected uh, in economic terms, to price convergence among all of us. So what I think, and I come to my conclusions, is that we should try to work on bilateral linking because by creating a set of bilateral linking, we would create a network of ETSs which might eventually uh, lead to a global ETS, this global market we dream of. And in this sense, I believe that linking can provide a bottom-up approach to the global climate action that is very much needed now to implement the Paris Agreement, and uh, especially now, maybe after uh, Donald Trump's election. In this sense, I also think that uh, Europe should keep maintain or reconquest sometimes its central role in the global ETS network. So it should promote basically this bilateral linking and we know that it's already doing that. But for, to do that, we need a good partner. Certainly China is a very attractive partner for its uh, economic, uh, geographical uh, dimension features, but it's not the only one. And in this case, if we want to uh, go along the pyramid, then we have to do more than one bilateral agreement. So this is one of the few cases where polygamy is allowed, and I think we should run along this road. I thank you for your attention, and I think I'll stop here.